These are not separate and distinct things, like you can have one without the others, but they're different aspects of a biblical motive. So the first thing here is faith. Now, faith is defined for us in Scripture as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That is, faith is a conviction, a firm belief. It's a present conviction of things we cannot see. Now, faith is absolutely necessary. We cannot please God without faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For Hebrews 11, verse 6, and the entire 11th chapter of Hebrews gives us examples of faith. The point is, God is not pleased with anything we do if we don't do it out of faith. Notice Romans 14, 23, whatever is not from faith is sin. So this reiterates the same point. If someone is not doing things out of a heart of saving faith, it's sin. Now, the initial part of faith is receiving the free gift of salvation. It's trusting in Christ as our Savior and Lord. This is saving faith. Without it, we cannot please God. Another motive or hard attitude taught in Scripture is repentance. Now, repentance in the Bible isn't just feeling sorry for your sins or even hating your sins. That's part of it, but it involves a heart attitude of actually turning away from your sins. You see, repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. Repentance is the negative idea, turning away from sin. Faith is the positive idea of turning toward Christ. So scripture tells us that true repentance is a motive for good works. Notice Matthew 3, 8, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And Acts 26, 20, I declared that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. Another hard attitude or motive is hope. Now, hope is faith that is particularly directed toward the future. We usually use hope as meaning just wishful thinking, like, I hope I get a new bike for Christmas, or I hope I can make it through this school year without strangling Bobby. But the Bible presents hope as a firm conviction. It's a settled confidence that something is going to happen. It's grounded in the promises of God. We can have hope in his promises, knowing for certain that he will fulfill them. 1 Thessalonians 5.8 Putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Then Hebrews 3.6 We're Christ's house if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. So it's an absolute confidence that God will keep his promises. Another motive, and one which is often misunderstood, is the fear of God. Now, Scripture teaches a number of things about the fear of God. First, it's the basis of knowledge and wisdom. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. In Proverbs 9, 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If we're going to be wise in our actions, if we're going to have knowledge about how we ought to act, Okay, that's ethical behavior. We need the fear of the Lord. So, second, the fear of the Lord is the basis of ethical integrity. Proverbs 8.13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And Ecclesiastes 12.13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. So, if we fear God, we're going to keep his commandments. Now, I've heard people say that the fear of God is the main idea in the Old Testament, but the New Testament is all about loving God. But we can't make that distinction. Both Old and New Testaments teach the need for the fear of God. Notice God says to Satan about Job, There is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So that's the Old Testament. But consider the New Testament. God's mercy is on those who fear him in Luke 150. 
And then Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You see, we have the same God in both Testaments and the same relationship with him in both Testaments. Now, there are two senses or concepts involved in the fear of the Lord. First, fear can mean terror and dread. Exodus 15:16, fear and dread will fall on them by the greatness of your arm. And we might think that this is a bad thing, that we should not have this relationship or this terror and dread of God. But honestly, there are times when we should be afraid of God, when we should dread him. The great Bible teacher of the 20th century, John Murray, said, It is the essence of impiety not to be afraid of God when there is reason to be afraid. The scripture throughout prescribes the necessity of this fear of God under all the circumstances in which our sinful situation makes us liable to God's righteous judgment. End quote. Think about it like this. If a child says, if a child does something wrong and mom says, wait until your father gets home. If the little boy says, hey, eh, I'm not afraid of the old man. Yeah, that boy is in worse trouble. Johnny should be scared of what his father will do to him. Likewise, when we sin, we should be afraid of God. We shouldn't be insolently puffing ourselves up in arrogance. Now, the second sense of the fear of God is reverence and honor. Leviticus 19.3, Every one of you shall revere or fear his mother and his father. That's the word for fear. We don't see God as our peer, as our buddy, any more than we see our parents as our buddies. No, we reverence and honor our parents. We look up to them. Same thing, but much more so with God. We look up to him. He is greater than us. We honor and revere him. Now, we have to be careful not to pit these two ideas against each other. They're both important in our relationship with God the fear and dread, and the reverence. This fear is a good thing, and it's commanded in Scripture. It's an essential part of our motive as Christians. But now we come to a central motive in biblical ethics, love. And I say this is central because Jesus himself said it was. In Matthew 27, 22, 37 to 39, Jesus called love the greatest commandment. He was quoting Deuteronomy 6, 5, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Leviticus 19, 18, which says, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Again, notice that the Old Testament commanded love, just as the New Testament does. Now, we see the necessity of love in 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Paul lists all these great things we might do, but without love, they're all worthless. So what's love? Well, in the Bible, love is not just an emotion, not only an emotion. It is an emotion, but it's much more than that. It's not just a warm, gushy feeling. Rather, biblical love is love that shows itself in actions. Notice again 1 Corinthians 13. It gives a lot of descriptions of love, the ways love acts. Paul doesn't say, Love is a feeling deep down in your soul. He doesn't say, love is a warm puppy. He says, love is patient. Love rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. Love endures all things. You see, love is something that shows itself in actions. And scripture presents the supreme act of love as being self-sacrifice. In fact, that's implied in the Greek word agape, for love, which actually means self-sacrificing love. This is the love God has shown us. You all know John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his Son. 1 John 3.16 expands on this. John says, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Christ loved us so much, he sacrificed his life for us and gave us an example that we should do the same thing for others. 
Notice now that Scripture doesn't just say we should love those who love us or love those who somehow deserve it. Romans 5.8 says God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, God didn't send Jesus to the cross because we somehow deserved it or were worthy of it. It was precisely when we were in rebellion against him and hated him, he gave his son for us. That's the extent of God's love for us. And if we're going to be children of our Heavenly Father, as Jesus said in Matthew 5, to 45 he said, Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So we also need to be willing to give of ourselves, even for our enemies. Notice now the emphasis on love gives a positive thrust to the law. See, we tend to think of law as don't do this, don't do that. But when we think about this focus on love, it turns things around. Love is a positive emphasis. Do this, do that, go help that person, find ways to do good. You see, the Christian life is not just about avoiding evil, but it involves positively doing good and right and love is the motive for that positive good. So in our next video, we're going to look at the work of the Holy Spirit in our motives.